Hey, happy Easter. And welcome to the church online. We are so happy to have you here today. I know I'm excited and I hope you are too. If this is your first time here with us today, or you've been part of the church family here at the bridge, we are so happy to have you here with us. With the COVID-19 pandemic, church isn't the same it used to be, but that's okay. Because shortly, we're gonna be led by Pastor Chad in this morning's service. And to end service, we're gonna be able to worship God together with a couple of songs. Wherever you are watching from, please drop a comment below because we wanna know you're here with us today. Guys, you're going to wanna check out thebridgemaryville.com during today's service. You'll find a section on the homepage where you can submit a connect card if you're new, a prayer request, find today's message notes, and even confidentially respond or connect with Pastor Chad. It's awesome, so grab your phone and plan to take your next step there today. Worshiping God by our giving is such a privilege. If you wanna to give today, you can do that online through thebridgemaryville.com. By the way, have you seen the content we have for our kids on Sunday morning? It is so much fun. Stick around after Pastor Chad's message for Bridge Kids Church immediately after. The Bridge strives to be a family that loves God and loves people. So thanks for tuning in and welcome to the family.
Well, good morning and happy Easter, everyone. It's so great to have you with us at Church Online, week number four of Online Church Only. And welcome to the bridge. Uh, No, you're not in our building today, but you are in our hearts. And uh, I've been praying for you this week. And I'm so glad you decided to join us on this Easter Sunday morning. Uh, It's interesting. And to me, it's actually remarkable to think that all of us together are experiencing something that none of us have ever experienced before. None of us have ever had to worry about getting up on Easter Sunday morning and going to church. But today, there's no one that could do that. We're all sitting in our homes, uh, maybe sitting. And some of you might be, still be laying in bed right now watching the sermon. But uh, it's totally different. But I pray this morning that we would encounter Christ Even though we're not in a building, even though we're not at church, we're going to still encounter Christ in a very real and natural way. Some of you this morning will remember this Easter for the rest of your life as the COVID-19 Easter, but I also pray that some of you would remember this as the morning that Christ truly changed your life. I'm believing for that. I've been praying for that already this week. So with that being said, let's dive into the scripture. I want to ask you to turn to Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5. And while you're turning, or maybe you're pulling it up on your phone, I want to uh, remind you that we're going to do communion at the conclusion of the sermon today. So uh, if you have some juice at home, maybe some crackers, whatever it would be that you could use, uh, I've prepared mine in advance and just thought I would tell you now in case you need to get that ready, but we do want to share in communion at the end of the service. So I just want to remind you of that now. We're going to look at Luke chapter 5 first. There's two different stories we're going to read today, very similar stories. One's in Luke 5 and one of them is in John chapter 21. And uh, I want to read this one to you, and then we're going to bounce right to the other one. So we'll go through a little bit of scripture here in the beginning. Let's begin reading in verse 1 of Luke chapter 5. And it says, On one occasion, while the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Genesaret. And he saw two boats by the lake. He, meaning Jesus, saw two boats by the lake. But the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. Getting into one of the boats, boats, which was Simon's, he asked him to put out a little from the land, and he sat down and taught the people from the boat. In case you haven't heard this before, obviously the reason Jesus is doing this, not only were the crowds coming in on him and kind of squishing him, he also, by getting out in the water, he's using the water for amplification so they can hear him better. So he's speaking to them, and verse 4 says, When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. Now, Jesus is a carpenter. Peter's a fisherman. Peter's been fishing all night and caught nothing. And I'm sure he's probably thinking this is a little odd coming from a carpenter. But uh, Simon answered, Master, we toiled all night and took nothing. But at your word, I will let down the nets. And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish and their nets were breaking. They signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so that they began to sink. Now this to me, in my mind, would be a perfect time for a selfie. (laughs) If I was Peter, if you can imagine, there's lots of people probably out fishing all night. He was not the only fisherman. He and the disciples were not the only fishermen. There's probably plenty of other people fishing. But he just hauled in two complete boats full of fish to the point where they're sinking, they would have been blowing up social media. You can just imagine that. But verse 8, what's it say? When Simon saw it, Simon Peter saw it. And what did he see? He saw the miracle that Jesus just performed. He fell down at Jesus' knees saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Now, if you're a note taker, uh, if you're a highlighter, underliner, I want to ask you, to highlight those words, depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. What Peter is really saying is, I'm not good enough. I'm broken. I'm not the guy who should be standing here before Jesus. Depart from me, I'm a sinful man. And verse 9, it says, For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish that were taken. 
And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, do not be afraid. Again, if you're a note taker, if you're a highlighter, I would like for you to just take note of those four simple words, do not be afraid. From now on, you'll be catching men. And when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. So Peter, James, John, and everyone else who was there have just been introduced to Jesus in the boat. They knew it was Jesus. He was there. He had asked them, hey, bring me out so I can teach. They heard him teaching. But in this moment when the miracle happened, all of a sudden, Simon Peter, his response says it all. He says, depart from me. I'm a sinful man. In other words, I can't do this. Now let's move three years down the road. Three years of being with Jesus. We're going to go to a very similar story in John chapter 21. This story is post-resurrection. So Jesus has been on the earth and he's been performing the miracles for three years. He's been teaching the disciples for three years. He's told them what's going to happen. Sure enough, he gets arrested. He is crucified. He's buried. But then he's risen again. He's already revealed himself twice to the disciples. If you remember, the first one was in the upper room without Thomas on the Sunday night. The week later, he came back for Thomas to show him the scars in his hands. If you remember, we talked about that last Easter. But here Jesus in John 21 is going to reveal himself again. Let's begin reading in verse 1. Again, three years later. After this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the sea of Tiberias. And he revealed himself in this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, which was doubting Thomas, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee and the sons of Zebedee and two other of his disciples were together. And Simon said to them, hey, I'm going fishing. So all the guys said, hey, we'll go with you. Let's go. I'm sure they probably needed to kind of process everything that they had just taken in over the last few days because they witnessed everything that Jesus had been talking about. I'm sure this idea of fishing was just to kind of get out away from people, to kind of get out on their own and just process everything that's gone down. So what happens? They went out, got into the boat, and just like the story in Luke, that night they caught nothing. Just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was him. And Jesus said to them, Hey children, do you have any fish? And they answered, No. He said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. Now, I got to believe the wheels started turning in their mind of going, wait a minute. We've done this before and we've heard this before. Could it be that that's Jesus again? So they cast the notes, nets on the other side of the boat. And sure enough, they haul in a huge catch. That disciple whom Jesus loved, therefore said, Peter, it's the Lord. And when Simon Peter heard this, that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for it was stripped for work. He threw himself into the sea. The other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, about a hundred yards. And when they got on the land, they saw a charcoal fire in place, with fish laid on it and bread. And Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon went into the boat, he got the fish and brought them up. And I got to think this is probably one of the most beautiful things that Jesus ever said in my mind. I'm just sitting here imagining this and it just sounds wonderful. These four simple words in verse 12, Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Doesn't that sound awesome? Come and have breakfast. I'd be right there. Uh, now, one of the disciples, excuse me, none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? But they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread and gave it to them, and so with the fish. This is now the third time that Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he raised them from the dead. Will you bow your heads with me? I know you're sitting at home, but I'm just going to pray that we can truly take these words and place them in our hearts this morning. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you would help me, Lord, to just really convey what you want to say this morning in these two stories. Lord, that we would see the difference 
the difference that Christ makes in our life. And I pray that that difference would happen in some lives this morning. For those who are listening, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Two very similar stories. We have the same cast in both stories. It's the disciples and Jesus and Peter being one of the main roles. It's the same scenario in both stories. They go out to do some fishing overnight. They catch nothing. Jesus shows up, says, hey, cast your nets on the other side. And it's the same outcome in both stories, a huge catch. My question I want to ask this morning is what's the difference? What's the difference in the story? I think the difference is Peter. Peter, a fisherman, a regular guy just like you and me. Peter, one who saw himself as a sinner, one who was not perfect. I dare say, Peter, the one whom you and I can relate to. The difference in these two stories is Peter's response when he recognizes he's in the presence of Jesus. In both stories, Jesus uses a miracle to get their attention. The same miracle. Fishermen fished at night because when... uh, The fish were in the shallow water in the evening or during the night when it was cool. As it warmed up through the day, the fish would go out into the deep. And so for them to catch fish in the day, that in itself was a miracle, especially in shallow water. Peter's response is the same response many of us had when Jesus got our attention. When we first recognized who Jesus was, our response is, depart from me, I'm a sinner. I don't deserve this. I can't earn this. Depart from me. I'm a sinner. And that was Peter's response in Luke 5. He had nothing. He had done nothing to deserve the catch. He even knows there's nothing he can do to pay back what Jesus has already done. Does that not sound familiar for you and for me? In this moment, in Luke chapter 5, Peter is more conscious of himself as a sinner than as Christ as the Savior. Let me say that again. In this moment, Peter is more conscious of himself as a sinner than Christ as the Savior. Instead of Peter saying, who are you that you can fill my net with fish? Who are you that you filled two boats completely full of fish? Instead of being focused on Christ and his greatness, Peter is focused on himself and his failure. Let's look at the response that Jesus gave in Luke chapter 5. Those same four words I mentioned earlier. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. I'm 43 years old, and in 43 years, I can tell you I probably, this would be my 43rd Easter that I've spent doing something with church. My parents, I've mentioned before, pastored. So I grew up in church since the moment I was born. I've been in church And can I tell you, I've seen multiple Easter's where we have people who will walk in the church. Maybe it's grandma who invited her whole family and she wants to have one of those, you know, family meals on Easter afternoon. But she wants all of her children and grandchildren and great grandchildren to come to church with her first. And then they go home and they enjoy some buckets of KFC. Anybody know what I'm talking about? And out of those children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren of grandma, there's always those who typically don't step foot in the church door. Maybe you're one of those watching today. And maybe those times when you've had to walk into a church, the moment you walk in, there's a sense of fear that enters into you. It's a fear of, depart from me, for I'm a sinful man. I don't belong here I don't deserve this. I can't earn this. I'm not good enough. Maybe that's been you in the past. Maybe you've had that feeling like Peter had in that moment. But here's the thing. Many of us who have been in church, we understand the truth and we understand the reality that there is nothing we can do to earn that. That's what you're feeling in those moments. You've convinced yourself that you can't do it, that you can't earn it, and Jesus gave it early, but I can't do anything to pay it back. And the truth is, you don't have to. If we look back in the Old Testament, what we call the Old Testament law, 
That has been completely fulfilled by Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. And because of that, we no longer relate to God based on working, earning, deserving, or doing. Because Jesus worked, earned, deserved, and did everything in one selfless act. We no longer come together saying we must do better, work harder, earn our place. We come before God admitting we can't and we're broken. And God says, but I can and I fix. That is the Easter message. So many of us like Peter recognize Jesus and we're afraid. We're afraid we can't do it. We're afraid we've done it too many times. We're afraid we've made promises and couldn't keep them. We're afraid someone saw us do it. And what are they going to think? And Jesus simply says to you this morning, do not be afraid. Just like the catch of fish on that day, Jesus is saying, I'm going to do for you what you cannot do for yourself. Everything Peter felt in Luke chapter 5 began to change when Jesus said those four words, do not be afraid. Over the next three years, you will see Peter's perception of Jesus go from a work mentality to a worship mentality. Lots of things happen in those three years. Peter witnessed a lot of miracles. He witnessed Jesus changing a lot of lives. And out of that, he began to learn it wasn't about a work mentality. It was a worship mentality. I'll just remind you of some of the promises Peter made. And this is one of the biggest ones. Matthew chapter 26, verses 31 through 35. Many people know this story. It's what Peter's famous for. Jesus is talking to the disciples and he says, This very night you will all fall away on the account of me. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. And you know Peter, verse 33, he replies, Even if all fall away on account of you, I never will. I never will. He made that promise. And verse 34, Jesus answered him. He said, this very night before the rooster crows, you'll disown me three times. Again, Peter declared, the Bible says he declared, even if I die with you, I will never disown you. All the other disciples said the same thing. You know, when it comes to talking to God, how many of us in here, I say in here, how many of you listening like myself, would be honest and say, you've made a deal with God. Anybody ever declared something to God? God, I know I've done this 10 times. I promise I will not do it 11th time. And not too long after that, there you are. God, if you'll just get me out of this situation, I'll live better for you, only to find ourselves falling away again. How many of us have made those deals with God? I think about my brother-in-law. For years, when Courtney and I first got married, uh, we would go to Jefferson City every deer season. Courtney's uncle lives there, and he's got land. And we would go, and uh, her dad, her brother, her cousins, her uncle, and myself, we would all go, and we would deer hunt together. And the ladies would go shopping while the guys deer hunted. And we had this one tree stand that was built on telephone poles. It was an eight by eight room and we could all sit in there and have lunch. So we would go out and hunt, come in and have lunch in this one stand and then we'd go out and hunt again. And I can remember Travis, Courtney's brother. I don't even know how the conversation happened, but somehow we got on making deals with God and Travis told us that he would make deals with God that if God would help him to shoot a buck one year, that he would live better for God. Or if if God would bring along the right buck, that he wouldn't lie or he would make these deals with God. And we're just dying laughing at the idea of making deal with God over a deer. How many of us though have made those deals with God. And here we saw Peter declaring to God, to Jesus, I should say, even if all fall away, even if I have to die, I never will disown you. You know what happens. Matthew chapter 26, verse 69. 
Peter sitting out in the courtyard, a servant girl came to him. You also were with Jesus of Galilee, she said. But he denied it before them all. I don't know what you're talking about, he said. Verse 71, he went out of the gateway where another servant girl saw him and said to the people, this fellow was, Je was with Jesus of Nazareth. He denied it again with an oath. I don't know the man. Verse 73, after a little while, those standing there went up to Peter and said, surely you're one of them. Your accent gives you away. And then he began to call down curses and swore to them, I don't know the man, and you know the story. Immediately, the rooster crowed. Can you imagine the shame? Can you imagine how horrible Peter felt in that moment as he heard the rooster crow thinking of the words of Jesus? Let me give you even something a little bit stronger is Luke's gospel. This just gives me chills when I read this, just thinking about it. Luke 22, verses 60 and 61. This is the third time Peter denies him, but listen to how Luke records this. The third time Peter replied, man, I don't know what you're talking about. And just as he was speaking, the rooster crowed. And verse 61 says, the Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. Can you imagine that look? Again, the shame that he's feeling in that moment, the embarrassment, the condemnation. All of that went on between Luke chapter 5 and John 21. Just a few weeks building up to John 21, a few days building up to John 21, Peter has just betrayed Jesus three times. But look back in John 21, verse 5. What does it say? Jesus is standing by the shore. Hey guys, did you catch anything? They're out in the boat. They don't even know who it is at this time. And they're just like, nope, didn't catch anything. And he says, throw your nets on the other side of the boat. And in that moment, they begin to think, could it be? And sure enough, John recognizes and says, it's the Lord. See, Peter realized it three years ago, and his response was, I can't. I'm not good enough. Depart from me. I don't deserve it. But look what he does this time. The moment he finds out it's Jesus, even though just days before he betrayed Jesus, the very thing he wants to do is not depart from him. The very thing he does in that moment is throw his cloak on and begin to swim for Jesus. He wanted to be in the presence of Jesus, even in his weakest moments. How incredible is that? It's the story of redemption. This is a moment where Jesus can set Peter's mind at ease to know, it's okay, I know what you've done. I know you denied me. I know you heard the rooster crow, but it's okay, I died for your failure. And I rose again so that you can start over. What I pray that you hear in this message this morning is this. We think it's more important doing better, working harder, doing right, be good for God. Those are good things, but those are not the most important. What is most important is when you are broken as much as we all are, when you are in your weakest moments, when you are seeing your faults and your failures and your weaknesses, that is when you should swim towards Jesus, not say, depart from me, I'm a sinner. So the question, the question I want to close with this morning, the question I want to ask each and every one of you watching, is when you are at your lowest moments, when you failed the most, when you've made those promises that you just couldn't keep, do you have a tendency to want to be close to Jesus or push back and say, depart from me, for I am a sinner? Are you the Peter of Luke chapter 5 or the Peter of Luke, John 21? Are we more God conscious in those moments or self conscious? You see, religion makes us more self conscious. But the gospel message, the fact that we're celebrating Easter this morning and that Christ rose for each and every one of us is what makes us more God conscious. Are you like Peter 
in Luke 5, your sins outweigh the Savior. There's not enough good you can do. That fear and doubt continues to haunt you. Can I tell you what Jesus would say to you this morning? He would say four simple words. He would say, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Once you begin to allow that grace to sweep over you, once you allow the fear to subside, allow the love of your everlasting Father to flow through you, you will want nothing more than to be like Jesus. You will become a fisher of men. This is hard to believe. For us that grew up in Sunday school and Scripture will prove that no matter how many times you sin, Jesus will be there and He will say to you, do not be afraid. Mark chapter 2.17 is a great example of this. When Jesus heard this, He told them, healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. I have come to call not those who think they're righteous, but Jesus said, I came for those who know they are sinners. He came for people just like Peter, who knew he was a sinner, and people just like you and me. Not perfect, but knowing that we fall short, knowing we can't do it on our own, Christ is there saying, do not be afraid. I'll do it for you. I'll take care of you. What made the difference for Peter in John 21, what drew him to Jesus rather than wanting to run away, I see in Romans chapter 5, verses 20 through 21, a great example of this very thing. It says, God's law was given so that all people could see how sinful they were. God's law helps us see how sinful we are. But as people sinned more and more, God's wonderful grace became more abundant. Do you hear that? The more and more people sin, the more God's grace became abundant. So just as sin ruled over all people and brought them to death, now God's wonderful grace rules instead giving us right standing with God and resulting in eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Sin is no longer ruling the earth. Grace is. I don't care what anybody else tells you. I can tell you today, this scripture tells us grace is what rules the earth. So how do we close this out? How do we end this this morning? Well, here's what I would say. God has systematically presented the evidence of who Jesus is throughout Scripture. And when evidence is presented in a courtroom, those who hear it have to make a choice. This morning, we must make a choice. The evidence has been presented, and we have to decide, are we going to live in fear of Jesus, always feeling inadequate, always feeling as though we're not good enough? Or do we recognize who Jesus is, and even in our faults, we're drawn to him. We just want to be in his presence. We just want to be around him. Would you do me a favor? Will you bow your heads with me this morning? I know you're sitting on your couch or on your bed or at the bar, eating breakfast, whatever you're doing. I just would encourage you to take this moment and truly allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you. closing your eyes and bowing your head. Maybe you're one of those who would say, I can relate to Peter today. I can relate. When, when, when you recognize you're in the presence of Jesus, you say, I'm not good enough. Depart from me. I don't deserve it. Or maybe, it, maybe you're just now becoming aware of Jesus for the first time. Kind of like Peter was in Luke chapter 5. He recognizes Jesus and he says, depart from me, I'm sinful. It's instinct within us to just want to be afraid and think, I can't do it. I'm not worthy. I can't earn it. And Jesus is here telling you today, do not be afraid. I died in order to do for you what you could not do for yourself. If that's you this morning, 
and you're hearing this, I want to pray with you. So with our heads bowed, right there, sitting in your home, will you pray this prayer with me? Just repeat after me. Say, Heavenly Father, I'm a sinful man or woman. I don't deserve what you've done for me. I don't deserve what Christ did for me. But I recognize in this moment just who He is. I recognize why He died on the cross for me and why He came up out of the tomb for me. And I accept Him in my heart right now. And I want to live not afraid, not worried that I can't be good enough. I don't want to live afraid that I can't live up to what I'm supposed to be. I want to walk in freedom. I said, I want to walk in freedom. Living in Jesus Christ with Him in my heart. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Pray that you prayed that prayer with me this morning. And if you did, I encourage you, there's a place on our website where you can go and you can just uh, send us a message and let us know. You can call me or text me or email me. I would love to just have some follow-up with you about the decision you just made. Maybe you're just praying that uh, to kind of rededicate your life to Jesus, or maybe you prayed it for the first time. I encourage you to please let us know, and we would love to just talk with you about that some more. One more thing I want to do as we conclude this morning, I mentioned that we were going to do communion. I think it's only fitting on this Easter Sunday, as odd as it is, as awkward as it is that we cannot be together in one building doing this service together, we can still share in communion. So if you have your communion elements in front of you, I just encourage you to bring them out. And here's what we're doing as we receive communion. We're celebrating the life of Christ We're proclaiming his death and we're rejoicing in his resurrection this morning. I want to pray a prayer uh, before we receive communion. And so I'm just going to pray that right now. I wrote this out just so I can read it. But I ask you again to bow your head with me as we pray this. Lord Jesus, we come before you in humility. We ask you to examine our hearts today. Show us anything that is not pleasing to you. As we take the bread representing your life that was broken for us, we remember and celebrate your faithfulness to all who will receive you. Thank you for your extravagant love and your unmerited favor. Thank you that your death gave us abundant life now and eternal life forever. And thank you for your victory over death. Help us to hold this fresh remembrance and the story that never grows old close to our hearts. And help us to share this message faithfully as you give opportunity. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Can we do that? Can we take of the body? In the same manner, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Jesus, thank you. Thank you for dying for each and every one of us. Thank you that we can celebrate your resurrection this day. And I pray this would be a day that changes people's lives, a day that people never forget because they accept you into their heart on this day. There are people watching services all over the world right now. And I pray that hearts and lives are being changed and we're grateful that we can celebrate Easter even sitting in our home where we're uh, together as a family. Father, I pray that we would honor you on this day, on this Easter Sunday. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Yo
Thank you again for joining us. Uh, awesome being with you. Thanks for watching. You'll get to hear another message from Pastor Mark for the kids. So kids stay tuned and uh, we look forward to seeing you next week. Hope everyone has a wonderful Easter. We love you and God bless you.